Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? they asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read? From the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Friend reminded me that uh, 31 years ago, Karen and I moved to Peterborough to start what has become Kingsgate Community Church. We had nine people in our living room. Now we've got thousands of people across four cities. And I want to say a massive thank you to hundreds and hundreds of faithful people who've partnered with us. And let's give God glory for all that he's done, his amazing faithfulness to us over these last 31 years. So happy birthday, everybody. <laughs> I want to start with a confession. You ready for it? I love eating. <laughs> Anyone else love eating? I, I love food. Food's not only very necessary, but it's also extremely enjoyable. Uh, apparently, uh, as a little boy, I so love food that I would hum and sing all the way through meals. <laughs> Karen tells me, apparently, I still do that today. So every day, I'm sure like many of you, I seek to have regular meals, but I also have snacks in between. I like to have an odd banana or some nuts just to keep energy up. But then there are certain times, particularly when we're on holiday, that I love feasting. Uh, we have the privilege of many years, we've been going to a friend's villa in Cyprus. And one of the things we love to do is go out for what's known as a Cypriot meze. Now, meze means taste. And so the idea, it's not just like one course. You have like often up to 17 different of these little taster dishes. It's absolutely fantastic. It's a real feast. Um, back in the UK, don't know about you, but I love the summer season. I like a big barbecue feast. And then I have another friend who often gives me a present, and the present is a meal for two at a sort of an upmarket restaurant. And, you know, I can think on occasion we had three, five, and seven courses. I love physically feeding and feasting. <laughs> you all know what's coming next, don't you? <laughs> but as enjoyable and necessary as physical food is, I believe there's something even more necessary and in many ways more deeply satisfying, and that is feeding and feasting spiritually. And so ever since I've been a Christian, I've sought to have regular spiritual meal times, devotions as we often call them. I, I right now have at least two regular meal times, morning and evening, where I spend time with the Lord. And then throughout the day, I like to have little, as it were, spiritual snacks, where I turn aside in the midst of a busy day to connect with the Lord. So that's like a daily pattern. But then there are certain times when I, I like to feast on the Lord. Maybe I'll take a prayer day or some extra time. And coming up, Right now, over these next 21 days, you and I have an opportunity all together across all of Kingsgate, in all of our locations, all different age groups, to come together, to sit up at the Lord's table and have a really fantastic spiritual feast. Yes. Yes. <laughs> now, for those of you who are thinking, hold on a minute, 
prayer and fasting, feasting, how does that work? And, and I just want to acknowledge some of you may have never really got started in prayer. Maybe you feel a bit um, discouraged by prayer right now, or you, the whole area of fasting feels a bit kind of overwhelming. You may even feel like you've got some disappointments. Can I say, this is a new season, we're heading into the autumn together, and I believe the Lord wants us all together to heed the call to make the most of this season of spiritual fa- uh, feasting. Uh, in um, Isaiah 55 verse 2, it says this, this is the Lord speaking, so listen carefully to me and you'll enjoy a sumptuous feast. You ready for a sumptuous feast? Spiritually delighting in the finest of food. So let me give you three principles as to how we can make the most of this season of spiritual feasting. Number one, we, we need to know the great joy, say joy, the great joy of spiritual feasting. You see, much as I enjoy physical food and it's necessary, there is a tremendous joy that comes when we spend time with the Lord. In fact, I believe that joy, um, enjoying God, is at the very kind of core of our purpose as human beings. Uh, The passage we've been looking at, Matthew 21, verse 12 to 16, I actually heard a series of messages on that um, very early on in my Christian life. And I was amazed as I I looked at the progression. Jesus comes into the temple, as Karen so beautifully laid out for us last week, and he comes and cleanses the temple and declares it, if you like, a house of purity. Then he comes and he establishes the primary purpose for the temple, which is house of prayer. Then he does miracles, house of power, then house of praise. But as I was listening to that teaching all those years ago with a hunger to know more about God, I felt the Lord speak to me and say, notice that the number one purpose of the temple then, and therefore the number one purpose for his house now, what is his house? It's us. So the number one purpose of my life and your life is to be a house of prayer. What do I mean by that? I mean that the reason fundamentally why we are here on planet earth is to enjoy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to know Him, to experience His love and His power and His presence, and to grow in delighting in Him now and for all eternity. And so Jesus says here, it is written, my house is will be called a house of prayer. When he says it is written, he's actually quoting from the Old Testament. The particular verse is Isaiah 56, verse 7. This is what he's quoting. quoting, These I will bring to my holy mountain, and notice this, I will give them joy in my house of prayer, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. So if the number one purpose of our lives is to have a relationship with God, house of prayer, spirit living in us, the number one benefit, if you like, or blessing of being in the house of prayer or living a life of prayer, according to this verse, is what? Joy. So the question is, what is the joy that we should expect and we can experience as we develop a lifestyle of prayer, and particularly over these next 21 days as we feast spiritually together? First, can I say, the number one joy in prayer is feasting on God himself. God himself, the presence of God. Psalm 34, verse 8. Um, Let's read this together, can we? All all together, wherever we're gathered. Count of one uh, of three. One, two, three. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. You see, there's something totally delightful about spending time with the Lord. I don't want you to think, oh, prayer and fasting. Oh, what a drudgery. What a duty. No, it's a delight. There's something about feasting on God that is the delight of my life. I believe God wants us to find joy in feasting on God. So how does fasting then, physically, from food, fit in with feasting spiritually? Well, um, the number one uh, meaning of fasting in the Bible is actually for a season, for the greater joy of feasting on God we would do without something that is enjoyable and good. Have you already got that I think food is good? That I like it? 
It's a good thing. It's necessary. It's enjoyable. But for a season, we say, Lord, there's a greater joy. I have a greater need in this season, which is to feast on you. And therefore, what we do for a season, we either do without food or reduce food. We say no to things. So for a season, we may say to the, our favorite Cornish pasty, Cornish pasty, I love Jesus more than you. <laughs> so for this season, you're not coming into my body or cakes, or pies, or burgers, <laughs> or whatever else, for a season. We're saying no to something for the greater yes of meeting with God. It's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. Now, so, so people often ask, so, so what are we to fast from in terms of food? Well, you know, in a short fast, three-day fast, many of us will do like a, a juice-only fast, and some people do a water-only fast. But, you know, 21 days, quite a long time. Many of us have got busy lives. If the Lord calls you to do something radical like that, that's, that's cool. But many of us, I expect, are going to do some kind of maybe health eating fast. It's what's known as a, a Daniel fast, where in the Old Testament, Daniel and his compatriots, for a time, basically, they, they said, we're not going to eat the rich food of from the king's table. It's basically kind of vegetables and fruit. And guess what? After 10 days, they hadn't died, they were healthier. Do you know that certain kinds of fasting are really good for you physically? Less medically, you can't do so. So lean into the, 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 the physical side of fasting, but don't get so caught up on it and spend all your time thinking about diets and foods and every time you smell food. Now, the purpose of all this is not to get obsessed about food. The purpose is to clear your body and can I say sometimes when you start fasting, particularly if it's the first time you've done it, you'll go through a little bit of a painful detox, but don't worry, joy is coming. <laughs> you just got to press through that. Okay, don't be discouraged. Set something that's achievable, stick to it, and then realize that the purpose of the fasting is not the doing without the food, it's doing with the presence of God. Amen? So, so, that, so that's fasting. And notice then that the, the greater joy of feasting on God, in the words of Psalm 37 verse 4, says, delight yourself in the Lord. He's our joy, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So that's the second thing. Our first joy is we meet with God himself. He satisfies us like no one and nothing else can, and we glorify him in being satisfied in him. He gets pleasure. Isn't that fantastic? Isn't that amazing that we can please our Father? But as we delight ourselves in him... He gives us the desires of our heart. In other words, we can experience the absolute miracle and wonder of answered prayer. And so this is the second, as it were, aspect of joy. Jesus said it this way. Ask in my name, according to my will, and the Father will most certainly give it to you. Your joy will be a river overflowing its banks. John 16, 23, 24. I'm sure like, I'm sure like me, you know, you, you sometimes think, well, don't, I don't always get... We, why we don't always see what we ask for, but I am absolutely sure that we have a God who's loving, who's powerful, who's faithful. Sometimes we see answers in the here and now. Sometimes we pray prayers that are, as it were, stored up for a future time. And, and you know, do you know God's eternal? He doesn't always work on our time. Have you noticed that? A bit frustrating, isn't it, sometimes? Don't you just wish God had come in line with our timing? But he knows best. I believe right now, not only are we going to see breakthroughs and answers to prayer over the next 21 days. How many are you ready for that? Yes. Miracles, answers to prayer, things suddenly turning on within the 21 days. But I also believe some of what we're going to be praying, much of what we're going to be praying, the answers are going to come in maybe months, in maybe years to come. I believe right now we are standing in the blessing of many, many prayers that we've prayed for the last 31 years. So let's sow again, let's go again, let's be persistent, let's be determined, let's fill our, as it were, sails with hope, knowing that God is a God who loves to answer prayer. And do you know there's incredible joy when you get answers to prayer. I remember years ago that um, very early days of, of being in the city and we had to um, buy a house here, and it was almost the cheapest house in the whole of the city, and it was pretty uninhabitable, to be honest. And so we needed a sum of money just to make it kind of livable in. Uh, we, we loved God, and so we were giving generously. We were giving way above the tithe. We were having to pray in uh, needs on a monthly basis. But this sum of thousands of pounds was way beyond us. But it wasn't way beyond God. <laughs> 
And so I remember it was in a conversation with a family member who basically her words were, well, I'm feeling quite flush right now and basically provided the money for us. And I, when I heard that news, I, I remember very clearly, I was standing in the door frame uh, of, of, um, in one of the doors in our house and I jumped with joy so hard and so high <laughs> that I dented my head, if not my joy. I literally went, crack. <laughs> But there's something about, you know, when, when you, you ask and you receive and your joy may be full. I'm looking forward to hearing great stories all across our lives of personal needs, family needs, mem uh, friends' uh, needs. Um, I'm believing for a greater sense of the manifest presence of God and breakthrough in all our cities and all our centers. Amen? Amen. But right now, I'm praying a bigger prayer. <laughs> it's good to pray for our needs, but kind of number one prayer on on my list right now is, God, this nation needs your help. We need a revival in the church. We need an awakening. Come, Lord, we're desperate. And I said to the Lord, revival, it's got to start somewhere. If you want to start with us, that's cool by me. doesn't matter. What matters is, Lord, come on our nation again. Do it again, Lord. I've studied revival. I've seen the Lord in the past, but Lord, do it again. Do the impossible. And I tell you, what joy we're going to see as we experience a fresh visitation of the Holy Spirit, a fresh move of God, not just in the church, but out into the world. Our nation needs God. Amen. So that's to, do, that's to do with our motivation. Know the great joy of spending time with God. He's our satisfaction. And then the joy of answer prayer. But if you and I, oh, so by, by the way, you know, how many of you know people in your sphere who don't yet know Christ, you'd like to see them come to Christ. You know, we've got a fantastic opportunity with the well-being season coming up. You know, just a brilliant opportunity to invite people along because everybody needs well-being. So why not start right now with thinking about, let me make a suggestion, five people who don't know Christ. And why not make a decision that every day for the next 21 days, you're going to pray for Janet and Bob and Dave and Richard and, and Sally and just keep praying for them. How many think that as we start praying, we can't, we can't override their will, but I want to tell you, as we pray, it's like the bombarding love of heaven is going to be a work in their lives. Wouldn't it be fantastic to see hundreds of people coming along to that celebration, coming along to that series, and what joy there will be in our hearts, in their lives and in heaven when we start seeing people are lost become found. There's joy. There's joy. So, but if we're going to make the most of this next 21 days of spiritual feasting, a couple of other things we need to do. Firstly, we need to select the right environment for spiritual feasting. You see, what I love about these Mediterranean mezes is they're not little snacks. You know, I, I eat my food pretty fast, but, but you can't rush these things. They come course after, lovely course after course, <laughs> fantastic. But you need time for it. It's not something, it's not just a quick snatch. You, you actually have to have time for feasting. And the great news is we can pray any time, any day, but there are certain seasons, and this is one of them, when if we are going to make the most of this season... It's not just going to happen because we say it's going to be a season. It's going to happen because you and I are actually going to take extra time, say extra time, to seek the Lord and to pray. Now, some of you are thinking, oh, well, I'm already too busy. How can I? Well, let me just start by saying, what time could you reclaim? So, for example, if any of you uh, drive to work and you're not already praying in that time, that's reclaim time. Maybe you're just watching way too much telly or way too much social media. Why not just reclaim that time? That's, it's not bad, but it's not exactly helping. Reclaim that time for something that's going to be spiritually far more satisfying. And for some of you, you may want to do something more radical, like say, so I'm going to set aside a half a day or whatever. But undergirding this whole season, this 21 days, is we're again, we're calling everybody to be involved in a 24-7 
prayer season, which basically means, as you've already heard, night and day, there's going to be an opportunity for us to dedicate ourselves to different prayer slots. Think of the power that's going to be released. Think of the kingdom activity that's going to come as hundreds of us all together in agreement sign up to those prayer slots and all together in unity we're saying, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Let breakthroughs come. There's a power that's going to come as we set aside time together. Amen. I so if you haven't already done so, for some of you, you may know, you know, it's an hour a day. Others of you, it may be more than that. Others of you, it may be an hour a week or whatever. But just sign up online. There's something about us coming together, not just as individual uh, prayer warriors, but as a prayer army. And we're going to say, Lord, we want you to intervene again in our lives, in our midst, in our cities, and in our nation. So there's extra time. But the second thing that if we're going to, as it were, create the right environment, we not only need time for spiritual feasting, we need the right place. Uh, you know, when I'm on uh, a holiday and checking out meses, I like to go to different places. Karen tends to like one place, and if it's good, we stay there. Uh, so, so we have a compromise. I like to <laughs> check out new places. And this, this, year, this time, I, I went on my favorite source, apart from the Bible, TripAdvisor, and I got out this thing, it was like right up there. And I thought, this, this, okay, we'll check it out. And sure enough, the food was great. It was, it was great value for money. But the atmosphere was horrible. We sat at this table and it was honestly, it was like Piccadilly Circus going around. I'm trying to, and I get a bit agitated in these scenarios. I'm like, Karen's like, calm down, David. I'm like, this isn't right. <laughs> this is not right. So I thought, well, let's go outside then. The, the air con wasn't working, so it was like massively hot in, in June. Anyway, so, so we go outside. I think, well, maybe this will be better. It's still quite hot. Sat on a chair. The chair broke. <laughs> Nothing to do with how much I'd eaten that holiday, I can assure you. <laughs> and so we came away. And although the food was good, it wasn't satisfying the, 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 because we weren't in the right place. There's other times, um, you know, when I, when I go into a restaurant, it's, they, it's not just the food. Everything's right. The music's right. I don't, again, I get irritated. You know, if you go in somewhere and they've got like booming disco music, I'm trying to relax here. Anyone else a bit picky and fussy like me? <laughs> but when the music's right, the lighting's right, it's just a fantastic, you can relax and enjoy. The food, it just tastes so much better. But I believe it's the same spiritually, you see. Just as, because... Prayer is about relationship with God. We can pray any time, any day, and, and this, is, this is ongoing. So it may be just you're in the most unfavorable environment. You're in the middle of work. You can pray under the breath kind of prayers. When it comes to spiritual feasting, I believe atmosphere and environment really matters. So it may be like, like me. There's something about going outside. There's something about creation. I'm making the most of these, these relatively warm, sunny kind of days. There's something about prayer walking for me. I'm just close to God's creation. I, I just meet with God in a wonderful way. Maybe for you, there's a special room. Maybe you haven't got a room. Maybe you've just got a chair. And there's something about that chair that will help you better than, say, another part of the house. Um, some of you think, well, I've just got so much going on around me. We've got, I've got the kids all around me. Well, why not take... Exa uh, uh, encouragement from the example of Susanna Wesley. She was the mother of the great revivalist John and Charles Wesley. She had loads of children around all the time and she was an incredible woman of prayer. So to let the children know this was prayer time, she'd literally get her apron, pull it over her head as if to say to the children, I'm with God. That was her space. Let's be creative. Let's find, you will find certain places will help you pray and connect with God better. So we need extra time. We need the right place. But in order for us to really um, make the most of spiritual feasting, I believe we need as much as possible to find out other people that we can spiritually feast with. You see, it is important that we pray on our own. Jesus tells us to go aside on our own. But I think there are seasons like this where there's extra enjoyment and power when we come together. You see, I've sometimes had an amazing meal on my own, but generally speaking, I like to have a meal with others, either Karen or family or, or close friends. Would you agree that feasting is better with others? But I believe spiritual feasting is better with others. Part of our 2019 
kind of mission and, and, and vision is we want to go deeper together. Let's go deeper together in prayer than we've ever done before. So what would that look like? Well, physically, can I say, even now, if you haven't thought about it, why not consider maybe taking some of those prayer, our, our prayer slots or, you know, more or less time and actually say, somebody in your life group or as a friend or a buddy or somebody you say, hey, let's do that hour, let's do that slot together. See, I don't know about you, but I find that being on my own, I, 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 I kind of can hear God clearly. I like contemplating. I like personal devotions. But when it comes to of intercession and really kind of going, there's something about I find that my concentration is better when I'm praying with others. How many occasionally have a problem with this little fella up here when you're praying? Your mind ever wander? There's something about when you're in a together kind of environment. There's an accountability. There's a, there's, there's a power. So think about maybe physically getting together with people, either in your home or... But, but you say, well, that, that's not possible. We're, just, we're too far apart. Well, can I say, let's maximize technology. Let's turn off some of the unhelpful stuff. Why not arrange a prayer Skype or a prayer FaceTime or whatever? I believe you can have a powerful... I know people in the church who've done this. Literally, everything, you know, I can think of some of the women in Cambridge. Literally, uh, they, they've been doing this for a, a number of the, these seasons where they have a seven o'clock together and they say, right, we're going to have our prayer Skype. They all dial in. They intercede together. Psh, power. So we've got praying with others, maybe people in your life group, maybe using technology. But there's something about these seasons of spiritual fasting we haven't got loads of prayer meetings going on, but make the most of the prayer meetings that are happening. Do come along to your touching heavens in your centers, but also come to extra prayer meetings in all of our centers. Right throughout the year, we always have prayer meetings before our Sunday services. You, you, I, I can guarantee you'll find something different happens when you feast and you pray together with other people. And then, of course, we have the wonderful promise as we're praying together. Listen to this. Matthew 18, verse 20. Again, truly I tell you, Jesus said, that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather together in my name, there I am with them. And if you look in the book of Acts at many of the great miracles and outpourings, very often it's, it's the two of them together praying or worshipping or they're praying together as a whole church. How many want to see breakthrough? Yes. Let's make the most of the spiritual season. Well, find the time, find the place, and find the people that you're going to be praying with. And then finally, true spiritual feasting, we also have the opportunity to choose different menus for spiritual feasting. If I, if I go along to a restaurant, I haven't got a lot of time, sometimes I'll just go for the dish of the day. You know, particularly if it's a restaurant, I know I, I trust the chef, and I think, well, he's prepared it especially for that day, and so I just haven't got time to mess around. I just go for the dish of the day. Well, I've got good news for you. The next 21 days here in Kingsgate, the Kingsgate team have prepared some spiritual culinary delights for you. <laughs> Via video, every day, you can check in, and for seven to ten minutes, you can load up your, your spiritual tank, as it were, and you can pray off the back of, what, of, of what's been prepared. You've got the little um, prayer booklets there. Think of that like as a menu telling you what dishes are, are coming up. Every day, sample the delights of the dishes of the day over the next 21 days. Is that okay? But I'm hoping many of us have got a bit more time than that. So in addition to that, um, can, I, can I strongly urge you during these 21 days, go a la carte as well. You see, if I've got a bit more time, than, than just one dish. I like, obviously, you know, may have a starter and a main, sometimes um, have, have a dessert as well. But I believe it's the same spiritually. You see, if we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and He lives in us, do you know that the God, the Holy Spirit, is incredibly creative? And I think the seasons like this, where it's an opportunity, as it were, to break into and experience different spiritual. Uh, uh, dishes, if you like, that, that we've never had before. So maybe there's just one way you pray right now. How many think there may be more than one way to approach God and, and get blessed? I know there are. There are all kinds of different ways you can approach God. For example, you know, last couple of years, I think I mentioned before, the Lord's been teaching me how to be still in his presence, and that's a miracle. 
But I've learned the power of just literally being still and receiving his love and letting, that, that, that's, that's a form of prayer. I like to pretty much every morning and evening just declare out set prayers and psalms in a very kind of methodical way and I find I connect with God. It, it just, just even the saying it out loud has, has a real power. For nearly 30 years now, I found incredible power and blessing in praying in tongues. The thing about praying in tongues, my, my mind isn't limited uh, to, to what I'm praying. And particularly if I want to pray longer, like say an hour, there's something about praying in tongues and I just trust that what I'm praying by the Holy Spirit is God inspired and God's fixing a whole bunch of stuff in my life and other people's situations that I didn't even need to know about. Amen. So consider going a la carte. In other words, let the Holy Spirit guide you and lead you into different ways of praying. I talked about music earlier on. You know, maybe it's classical music will help you, but I, I find, and I, I've said to the Lord recently, I don't know, do enough of this. I'm going to be leaning into just listening to worship music. On, on Friday, I just had an amazing time of encounter listening to a picture, particular album and you know, that song that we sometimes sing, Do It Again. And I found myself that the words and the music combined, if, uh, almost like it was a fresh sense of faith. And with that atmosphere, I found myself going for things. Yes, Lord, into this season, do it again. That it was the music and the worship ushered me into a different place of prayer. Be innovative, be creative. Paul puts it this way in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 8. He says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. So there's the set menu, the, sorry, there's the dish of the day, there's the going a la carte, all kinds of different ways of prayer. Experiment, allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. And then there's what I call spiritual set menus. When I go to a restaurant, I really like set menus. As I say, I make, I make enough decisions in my life. Sometimes I just like to sit down, trust the chef, just bring it on. <laughs> And the great news is the Lord has given us a number of spiritual set menus in the Word. Sometimes when Karen and I pray together, we kind of like to know, sometimes we just pray, but sometimes we like to know where we're going in advance. So we say, okay, what should we pray today? And if we haven't got a lot of time, we take like a sort of a, a, a smaller menu, four-course menu. It's found in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 9 to 10, and it's called the Prayer of Jabez. Here's, here's a gr great short four-course menu. Listen to this prayer. It's really sophisticated. Oh, that you bless me indeed. Course number one, prayer for favor. And enlarge my territory. Prayer for increased influence. Let your hand be with me. Prayer for greater anointing. Keep me from harm so that I be free from pain. That's a prayer for protection. And you can pray that in 30 seconds. You can pray that over half an hour. But I pray that literally thousands of times. And just like the Lord loved to answer Jabez's prayer, how many know he wants to answer our prayers now that we're in Christ by the Holy Spirit? He wants to pour out increased favor and influence and anointing and protection over our lives. But then there's the pièce de résistance, the set menu of all set menus. It's a seven-course delight. It's called the Lord's Prayer. Course number one is adoration. Our Father in heaven. Course number two is praise and worship. Hallowed be your name. Course number three is intercession. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Course number four is petition. Give us today our daily bread. Course number five is confession and repentance. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Course number six is protection. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And course number seven is another praise course. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. It's glorious. The thing I love about the Lord's Prayer, and I'm sure the Lord designed it that way, it was the way he told his disciples to pray, is its versatility. So if you haven't got a lot of time, you can literally have a quick taste. You can pray the Lord's Prayer in 30 seconds. Or as I often do, you, you can expand it and take, if you like, each line at a time, and maybe 20 minutes or 30 minutes, you're using it as the base of your prayer time. 
I'd encourage you if you're seeking to pray an hour and you don't know how to do it, if you speak in tongues, mix the Lord's Prayer up, let the Holy Spirit lead you and pray through the Lord's Prayer. It's fantastic. Then there's times when you take even longer because the Lord's Prayer is a seven-course feast. How many excited about this next 21 days? Let's make the most of this season. Let's go into it with faith and expectancy that we're going to experience great joy, the joy of his presence and the joy of answered prayer. We can see breakthroughs, personally and collectively, inside and out. Little prayers, big prayers, we're going to see breakthroughs. Think about the environment, you know, think about extra time, think about where you're going to pray, think about with who you're going to pray. And then go with it on an adventure with the Holy Spirit. You know, start with the dish of the day, think about all kinds of different ways that you can pray, and then pray simple prayers like the Lord's Prayer and watch what the Lord is going to do. It was May in 1940, and this nation was facing an even bigger crisis than the one we're doing right now. The Nazi forces were basically overrunning the Allies in Europe. And George VI, the king, called a national day of prayer. At stake were the lives of about a third of the million Allied troops, who without some kind of intervention would literally either be killed or captured by the Nazis. It would be amazing if yet again we have a national call to prayer. It's 26th of May on a Sunday. Literally, all across the nation, people packed into chapels and churches and cathedrals, calling on God to intervene. That very next day, inexplicably, Hitler told the armies that were pursuing the, the, the Allied troops, he told the, the, his generals to, to stop the advance. Historians still can't work it out now. It was one of the biggest tactical blunders of the war. At the same time, a massive weather kind of storm came over the English Channel, stopping the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, from bombing the Allied ships as they were coming over to the continent to re rescue the troops. And then the following day, as the ships needed to go back, escorting the troops, a supernatural calm came over the channel. And as a result, a third of a million Allied troops were rescued in what's known as the miracle of Dunkirk. Wow. A call to prayer. And God intervened. The crisis we now face is not just the obvious political and economic one with all the confusion that's going on with regard to Brexit. For many decades now, we've faced and are facing a deepening moral and spiritual crisis. And right now, if I'm honest, I'm not in faith for a national call from the government to a day of prayer. But we don't have to wait for that because in 2 Chronicles 7.14, it says not ultimately about governments. 2 Chronicles 7.14 says this, if my people, my people, who are called by my name. That's us folks together with millions of Christians in churches and movements across this land who are praying like never before. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, how do we do that? Partly by fasting. And will seek my face and pray, house of prayer. And turn from their wicked ways, house of purity. Then the promise is this, threefold. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. The, the, the people of God, and I will heal their land. Let's pray. Father, as we enter this season of 21 days, we take it as a call to the whole of Kingsgate. A holy, solemn, and joyful Invitation to 21 days of spiritual feasting. And so, Lord, we ask that your Spirit would come on every single one of us, listening and watching to this message, and you'd be very specific with us, <clears throat> and you'd strengthen us, and you'd encourage us, Lord, 
and you'd inspire faith and hope that we might seek you and find you and experience breakthroughs in a whole nother way. In advance, we give you glory and praise for answers to prayer and for the satisfaction of your presence. We give you all the glory and the honor in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said aloud, Amen.